All right, welcome everyone. This is episode 34 of the Orchestra Podcast. I can't believe we're so many episodes in. Just having started this back in March is a way of keeping engaged with students. And as we enter this new school year, many people having their first day of school today. For me, it was uh, calling parents and families and making sure they have everything they need and you know, working out those last couple of scheduling problems as me and my, my guest, Mr. Jim Rice, were just talking about before we got on uh, the horn today. Uh, so say hi to everybody, uh, Mr. Rice, and tell us just a little bit about your history and, and who you are and what you did. Well, it's great to be on, and I'm really looking forward to this. I, I, uh, I'm at the age, I, I retired two years ago. This is actually now my third fall, not stepping into a classroom. Um, I taught 40 years as a public school teacher, um, and I was actually the band director at Port Angeles High School, where you're teaching now from 1980 until 1984. I graduated from Port Angeles High School in 1974. So, so uh, Port Angeles is, is a home, is, is my home. I still think of it as my home, although my, my, uh, well, my dad has passed away, but my, uh, my folks moved away from there in, oh, about 1993, four, five, something like that. And uh, so I don't get up nearly as often as I do, but as, as I did then. But um, we'll look back on on that time as as one of the highlights of, of my my life, uh, you know, just growing up there. Um, I spent most of those 40 years teaching high school band, high school orchestra, mostly the last few years. I was a 16 years at Inglemore High School when I retired. And uh, even though I did teach some band, it was a, it was sort of a team teaching situation with Ted Christensen. Uh, everybody referred to me as the orchestra director, and they referred to him as the band director. That's just just how it was. So, uh, and now the last two years, I I retired. Uh, my wife and I have uh, two grandsons, and we try to spend as much time with them as we possibly can. Well, I wonder, as someone who really devoted their lives to the field of education, and uh, and I don't think any of the educators out there will will doubt me in saying that that you always produced a, a quality product, uh, whatever stage in your career that 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 you were at. Uh, something that that we tend to do, those of us who were so highly motivated by our roles as music educators is really throwing our, our whole lives into our job. And, and there is a tendency to get consumed by it. And, and um, I always believe in, in being honest and, and, and truthful in, in doing things. And uh, I feel that I need to share with the audience that I, I was 30 minutes late to this meeting. And I, I really feel rotten about it. And there's no amount of excuses will undo a mistake that you've made, but I wonder if, uh, Mr. Rice, you might talk to us about how a young, ambitious teacher or a young, ambitious student can avoid putting themselves in that place where they're ending up having to apologize all the time for, for being late or for not spending enough time at home, for being at work for 12 hours and not seeing their spouse or their kids. How can we balance how much we love our jobs with uh, having responsibilities to the, the people around us. Well, that's a that is a tough question. Um, I taught for let's see, I'm going to do a little math here. Two, six, eight. I taught for eight years before I was married, and uh, uh, and and. My job was, that was pretty much my life. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I could have just as easily had a cot in, in my office at school and, uh, and, and just stayed there. I, I, um, if, I wasn't, if I wasn't teaching, I was planning or writing or, uh, you know, it, it, it was just, it was, it was all consuming. And, and it was okay with me that I was enjoying it. Um, I tell the story uh, one time I was teaching in Port Angeles and uh, where I had gone to school. So, you know, my, I was teaching with former teachers, you know, that kind of thing. And I remember running into 
uh, one summer I, I, I ran into uh, a, a social studies teacher. He, he taught geography when I was in, in ninth grade. I remember running in into him downtown and uh, you know, a young teacher. I was very excited about what I was doing. I was writing marching band drills and I was arranging music and doing all. So I, I just spewed all of this as we were, as we were talking and, and he was very polite. And by that time he was, well, maybe not as old as I am now, but, uh, but he was older and, uh, and he just very politely listened and, and, uh, uh, and I just kind of went on and on finally kind of wound down just a little bit and and he said you know it's been a long time since i've been that excited about going to work and it, it hit me because i thought I, I never really liked him very much as a teacher i respected him and uh, but but I, I just never thought he was very enthusiastic you know and uh, and it hit me that uh, that you know that, that maybe there was a pretty big difference between somebody had been around the block a few times and, and somebody else who, who had that burning desire. Well, then as, as life went on and, and I had other activities and I got married and we had children and, uh, and other, other responsibilities came along and whatnot, I, I had to learn, uh, I, had to, I had to learn how to still be good at what I was doing Maybe I was, maybe I didn't need to do so many different things. Maybe I needed to focus on a few things and do those well, which would allow me then the time to be able to do the other things that, that life was asking of me. Um, and my wife was very patient, very loving. And, uh, and I appreciate, I, well, I appreciate her more than I can say and in, in how she was able to kind of help, help me turn that corner. And I had I had lots of mentoring from from people that I asked along the way again from from those who had extra experience that, that they were able to kind of show me how to handle some of those things too. And I appreciate well, that. The great Dave Robbins, uh, who was during my time at PLU the music department chair, the beginning of every year would uh, have this uh, this big meeting with all the music majors. Uh, and everybody taking private lessons, and he would give the same speech every year, and it was, say no. If somebody asks you to do something extra outside of your studies, say no, because your job is to do well in school. And being the ambitious young person that I still am, I said yes to a lot of things and, and paid the price for double bookings and trying to figure out how Am I going to get from Tacoma to Olympia in five minutes? Uh, and it just can't be done. And uh, something that uh, I learned from Dale Johnson when I was uh, 12 or 13 playing at the Evergreen Music Festival, and I, I was holding up the rehearsal somehow. I think I had dropped my music everywhere, and I said, I, I'm sorry. And he said, I don't need your excuse. I need you to be ready. And if, if you look at it the wrong way, you could see that as harsh, but he was telling me, you know, the, your apology is nice and all, but I need you to make it right. So it, in all of your years of teaching, I'm sure you had more than one instance with a student where they were coming at you with excuses and, and well-intentioned and maybe they were good excuses. But if I'm a student and I find myself in a position where uh, I've, I've done wrong or I've double booked myself. How can I start to make that right with my, with my teacher or uh, with whoever it is that, that I've uh, gone out of, out of bounds with? The, the making it right is, is sort of um, my, I, I have a mantra and uh, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, don't sweat the don't sweat the small stuff. You know you, you've probably heard that before, and um, and and I I know I've used this more than once with with students. Is sweat the small stuff, take care of the little things, and then you won't have any big things. Um, and and I've I've tried to live that way. You know just um, uh, you know if get up every day, make my bed. Get up every day, take care of those little things that 
that then when something big does hit you, it, it doesn't throw you off uh, because you, you know, you're taking care of those, those little things along the way. Um, it, it took me a long time to, to kind of figure that out. Like, you know, with, with studies, you know, it's easy to pro procrastinate. And then what was just a little thing they added to and added to and added to, and all of a sudden you got, you got this big monstrous task ahead of you that didn't have to be in the first place if you would just taken care of it along the way. Um, we as musicians are probably the epitome of figuring that out because if we don't practice a little bit every day, pretty soon we're not ready for whatever it is we need to be. And, and, uh, and so it's that self-discipline of making sure that every day we, we take care of the tasks before us, it makes us feel better, we, we feel more comfortable with the day, and then we can enjoy things more because we're not we're not feeling this pressure of some big thing that didn't have to be there in the first place. I, I love that answer, and it it so uh, clearly relates to daily practice. I'm sure you got this question all the time throughout your teaching career of of kids asking, "How many days a week do I need to practice?" And and my answer is always only on the days that you eat. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but my philosophy is that I don't really have uh, an established boundary on how many minutes a day a student needs to practice. There's a, a great chart that I saw from Joe Divig once that of how many minutes you need to practice to achieve a certain level of musicianship. But it's more important that it, it's, it's daily and incremental. And, and something as simple as, you know, making one's bed in the morning is that that builds the kind of discipline that, that lends itself well, not just to music, but it, in life so that you don't, you're not struck one day with, you know, we need to accomplish this huge task and we have eight hours to do it. If you've, you've done just a little bit of work over a long period of time. And, and, and the focus during that time is what is what really, you know, do I have a goal? Is there something I really need to accomplish? How can I how can I expedite that into into a, for me it always was how can I expi expedite that into the smallest amount of time so that I can move on to something else, you know? And uh, but the self discipline of getting after it every day is is. <laughs> was more helpful to me in anything I did along uh, along my life than, than anything else. And, and I'm someone who, who did not grow up with a lot of routine. And uh, in, in my earlier younger years, uh, living over in, in Eastern Washington, uh, in a little farming community, Othello, there certainly was more discipline out there. You've got to wake up at 4 a.m. and change the water or the the crops don't get fed and then the yep. crops don't grow and then you, know, yep. you, you see the way it spirals out of control. Yep. And I think a, a lot of my students have a, a similar experience in, in not having so much of that set routine. And when we're looking at this, these distance learning models that uh, students are in right now, it's gonna be really tempting to not keep a routine. Yep. And just, I'll get to the work when I can get to it. Yep. So if, if I was your student right now and, and you were still teaching in this, well, sort of a teacher's nightmare of, we, we've still got to teach music, but I can't be in person, is what would uh, you suggest to a student to keep a routine so that their, their educational hygiene stays up to code uh, while they're in this digital environment? Yeah. I, I had the blessing, I guess, of growing up in a home where, um, where routine um, was, was different than I, I'm guessing that, that most kids are growing up in. Most kids now, uh, your parents have a nine to five job or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's a set time. You, you get up, you do whatever you have at home, you go to work. And when, you, when you're done with work, you come home and then you do something else, right? I grew up in a home. Uh, my, my folks owned uh, uh, 
real uh, own property. Uh, uh, they had a, a big old apartment house where they kind of carried catered to uh, older older folks, senior citizens, and and um, right there in Port Angeles, and and so so their their job was was not a it was it was not a regimented i had to go to work from this time to this time it was it was like the the example you just gave of a farming a farmer you you have these jobs that you have to do and there's some set times you know if you got to milk the cows you got to milk them at so, so such and such a time but pretty much you know you're kind of the free to kind of set your own day and that that was how it was with my parents and it would have been really easy to just kind of let things slide and not get not get the work done but they were disciplined and and had projects that they set up had a goal for each day what they were going to accomplish and uh, you know some were short term goals some were long term goals but but in all that they did there was this routine of going about their business you know and, and getting that done based on what they set well kind of what we're doing now with this online learning is is the same way i'm guessing that in most cases at least uh, you know, my my daughters are both music teachers now and and i'm i'm looking at their schedules and they have kind of a kind of a schedule but then i know i know that there's going to be a lot of time where they're going to send students off to to work on their own the students are going to have to kind of figure out yeah i got it I got this responsibility. I've got to get this done. How can I? How can I figure out how to fit it into the day? How can I make sure that I cross all these I's and dot all you know? No, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. <laughs> Whoops. And uh, you know, get all those things done, and uh, uh, and and then you know, get back, come back for more, or you know, whatever the routine is. But it's it's up to me. It's it's it, it's my self-discipline. It's my interest in getting, you know, getting what I need. It's my interest in giving back. It's it, whatever that motivation is um, uh, that will will kind of set or, or help me to set goals uh, for getting all of that done. Well, the, the example you gave about your parents plays really well to some of the high school students I have who aren't just taking care of their own study if they're staying on their schedules, but looking after several younger siblings perhaps yep. and making sure that they get their work done and it would it would be really easy to kind of not make my bed but make sure that little brother and sister are awake and yep. make sure they have breakfast and lunch uh but then have neglected their own responsibilities yep yep uh and uh i, I forget where i heard it first but it, it's it's easier to tear down a wall than it is to build one and when we think about routines and discipline, it's really easy to fall off the wagon with one's discipline. I mean, just something simple like washing the dishes, for example. You know, if you don't load the dishwasher every night and unload it every night or whatever your schedule may be, the sink starts to fill up and then it's, you're looking at the pile of dishes and it, it's an even harder job to get to the point where you can load the dishwasher and then you gotta wait for it to run a full cycle before you can load it again is yep. if our if our students out there watching can make sure that they've taken care of their routine first their needs and and then get to little brother or sister or have figured out how in your day you're going to do it all uh because there there are a lot of people like and I'm one of them that really wants to take care of the people who are in need and then I I neglect my own needs and responsibilities and yep. it, and that's a, a hard, hard wall to build back up once you've you know broken it down. And it's too easy. It's very fragile to just tip it right over. I agree. I agree. So when uh, we're thinking about music programs in particular during this time, uh, I, I'm I'm worried about students' identities. Because a lot of the reason that we have kids that show up in our in our music classrooms, regardless of how talented they are, is that, that they're, they have arrived and they stay in our programs to make music with each other. 
And for the majority of students, it's not, I'm showing up every day because I love to be better at clarinet and I want to play, you know, the Shostakovich Festival Overture that Mr. Rice has programmed for us. Uh, it's, this is the only class that I have with my best buddy since fourth grade. How do we as educators continue to provide that connection and that sense of identity when we, we can't necessarily meet in person? The, yeah, there's, there's kind of a twofold. And I, I suppose if you were to ask every individual, you know, why are you an orchestra? Why did you sign up for band? Every, every single one would probably come up with some different answer. Some might be kind of alike, but, but for every person, it's, it's a different thing. And one of the things I've noticed about people over time is uh, particularly, you know, the, the better a musician is, the more they practice. So, so what I, so the, 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 the musicians that are, are, are the best ones that you can think of, generally speaking, they practice more than everybody else. Well, why is that? Well, I, I think it's because, because they're good, they probably have the ability or the, 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 to, to be more expressive because then they can make that instrument speak better. It can, it can express what they're feeling uh, better better. And so, so because they practice, they get better, then they enjoy it more and they enjoy it more. So then they practice more and then they get better. It's, it's the circular kind of a thing. Right. And, and, and the, uh, the opportunity then to be able to, to truly enjoy, to be, be truly, um, you know, that instrument then becomes kind of a, a, a part of them and so they can be better at expressing themselves. There, there's more personal enjoyment out of that. Well, then you combine that with being able to express together with somebody else, then it, then it, it it's not just two people expressing, it's, it's the, it's the, what comes out of it. And so it's, it becomes exponential and it's, in it's, enjoyment and benefit and you know that kind of thing so i know because i'm old that this pandemic thing is not going to last forever i know it's not so eventually we're going to get back and so I, I guess my encouragement is to be able to use this time while we're separate and it's a little harder to get together to to develop my ability to be personally expressive on my instrument so that when it's done and we can have all of the freedom of being able to just think of how much better I'll be to, to be expressive on my instrument and then exponentially better when we get together with somebody else, you know? And, and so uh, I, I, I know I have the benefit. I have the benefit of being old and I know that, this too will will pass and um and it's hard when you're younger to be able to kind of see the see that tunnel you know i i thought i, I remember when i was in ninth grade thinking wow four years till i graduate four years that's an eternity it will will it ever end you know it was that kind of thing and now i i taught for 10 times that four years and it went by like that you know and so I, I can laugh at you a little bit. You know, I can, I can laugh thinking, yeah, 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 four years. But you'll, you'll get it eventually. And, and, uh, and all I can do is encourage you by saying, you know, it, it, it'll pass. And, and what will you do during that time to prepare you for that time when you can do, get off and have the freedom to do what you want to do? And I've had so many guests make, make that point in particular, that this is the time to, to focus on your sound and your technique. And so that when we do get back together and we sight read our first piece of music, that maybe there's a moment where there's an option to go into third position and you take it without Mr. Rodal begging and pleading and bribing you <laughs> to play it in third position. 
Yeah. And uh, something that one of my earlier guests, Dr. Quentin Morris said, is that one of the number one reasons that students quit a uh, band or orchestra or, or choir is that they don't love their sound. Yep. And I, I can you imagine? I mean, if, if you don't play very well and you don't like how you sound, why would you want to go into a room? I mean, I'm mean, I mean, just plump, thinking outside. Why would you want to go into a room and listen to that? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So you have the option of quitting or fixing it. Yes. Yes. And, and that's the juncture we're at right now where you can't hide um, um, around it within the people who sound okay or pretty good or very good and the people who are there just because their friend is in orchestra are faced with this choice now of quit or make my sound better yep. and and I sincerely desire for every student to make the choice to improve their sound because of the, the reasons that we've discussed up until this point of and and I'll say it in, in the way that I've said it before many times in this podcast is that what we teach in the, the music classroom, as much as we teach, you know, notes and theory and history is this self-discipline and these life skills that apply to everything outside of music, yep. showing up on time, being reliable, uh, being prepared and, and knowing how to do that incremental dedicated work on whatever it is that, that you're doing. Yep. And so if uh, somebody makes the choice not to continue with their, their music studies because we're on our own and you're forced to face your own sound, whatever you know, your relationship is to the way that you sound on your instrument or, or with your voice, um, if you don't make that choice to improve your own sound, I think it's gonna be reflective in uh, the other avenues that your, your life takes you to. That if you, you, if you consistently make that choice not to put in the work, uh, you're, you're going to find yourself blaming everybody else for your situation. And, and, and I, I refuse to do that for myself. There have been you know, so many tough situations that I put myself in, uh, like earlier today where I was late to our meeting because I was talking to a parent. Uh, if I didn't confront myself with that and say that 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 was my mistake, I own that and and look at the the ways that I need to better focus my time and uh, the way that I respect others' time and staying dedicated to a schedule that I've made for myself, then, then I'm not going to improve that wall that I've spent so many years building of of dedication and commitment and uh, discipline, it, it will just come toppling down. And so those students who are thinking about quitting, it is you've just knocked down every bit of discipline that you may have built up, up, yep. up until that point. Yeah, there's an old, there's an old saying, uh, you know, for, for us as musicians, we want to play in tone, in tune, and in time. Mm -hmm. Well, all, all three of those, I mean, are pretty obvious for a musician. We want to make sure that our sound, we, we, we sound good. We want to make sure that we're playing in tune. And we want to make sure that everything is is timed out right so that it makes sense, right? Um, and, and I don't think anybody argue that those th aren't, those three aren't, you know, probably the three most important things of what we, what we do. And, and when we do all those, then we can be expressive, you know, and we can't really express what our in, inmost feelings are if if it doesn't sound good and you know, we can't express it if it's if if we can't really tell what the tune is and we can't really express it if we're if we're not expressing something in time well i mean the same thing goes with everything else that we do in life we, no matter what we're working with uh who we're working with no matter what we're doing on our job are are we are we expressing things in a way that our, our tone is encouraging or supportive or or are we bringing us down or bringing someone else down you know are we in tune are we really listening to what's going on around us and making sure that what we're doing fits you know and 
Okay. Are we on time? I mean, that, that should be <laughs> self-explanatory, you know? And so, so the, the, what are just natural things that we, that we do and we know we need to do in music are immediately and directly applicable to everything else we do in life. That it's, I, I keep coming back to that in all the conversations that I've been having. And I, I'm lucky to have been invited to serve on the, the National Orchestra Council for uh, the National Association for Music Educators. Nice. Uh, Beth Fortune, who teaches in Ballard, yep. invited me yep. to be on that team. And, and it has been uh, a real honor to work with some, some of the, the best educators around the country and hear, hear the same things from them that I have thought and believed for myself that what we teach isn't how to play violin or how to you know, play trombone. We're teaching how to express your feelings in the right way uh, because for the five minutes that we're playing a piece by Brian Balmages, uh, you don't need to worry about your math homework that needs to be done later. You can just think about, you know, playing that B flat right in tune and you can escape from uh, whatever anxiety you're having about that math class or perhaps something more serious. And, and we're, we're teaching young adults how to be on time and why it's important to be on time. Uh, it, it's just what we teach is so much more than playing the instrument. And it's, it's why music education, at least from my perspective, is so essential in, in any, uh, any school anywhere in the world that, that music education is a, is a part of, of their um, curriculum. Yep. And, and that's going to look like different things in different places. I think not, not every school needs a marching band. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you're at a UN school somewhere in Holland, you probably don't have an American football team that stipulates having a marching band, but you probably have a, you know, a good wind group or a brass band or a, certainly a choir or a strings program. Uh, but it's the, the same thing as being taught and regardless of what instrument you're playing is how, how to be a responsible person that's in harmony with your community. Yep. 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 I agree. <laughs> and then, and then you put all that together with, it allows you to be expressive in a way that nothing else mm. can. Mm -hmm. that, to me, that's the, the, that's the number one thing for why we're in music is, is, you know, it, it is the expressive qualities of music that, that you can't find anywhere else. But we, we could always make uh, parallels between a sports program and a, and a, uh, you know, a music program but it's that expressive thing that we have over the sports folks, you know? Yeah. And, and, and in particular for those of us who have a hard time expressing our emotions, you know, verbally, uh, d despite having uh, an Italian mother with a big Italian loving family, uh, somehow Norway won in the soup. And, and it, you can tell both in my complexion and in the way that I deal with difficult emotions is that I, I find that challenging. But through music, and, and we had this happen a couple of times at school when there were hard things that happened in our community that we, if, if we found the right piece of music and we were all in the right mindset, that we could express things that we were feeling that could never be said in words. Yep, yep, I agree. And every now and again, uh, well, a, a great example, over the summer, um, I was really hurting for my seniors that didn't get the experience that, that, that they were owed, you know, really. That they had put the work in, they had been in orchestra since fourth grade, and that All City Strings concert that Port Angeles is so famous for, uh, yeah. it, it couldn't happen. And there's nothing anybody could have done to change that. And I wouldn't have held it even if they had told me uh, I was allowed to based on the, you know, the science out there and, and the way that this disease is spreading. Uh, but I didn't really know how to deal with that. And I, I put on uh, just the playlist that I have of, of, of classical music. And the last movement of Mahler's Third Symphony came on. And I wasn't 
really thinking about at the moment about the the senior class and the way I felt for them, but the way that that movement develops and unfolds, and it's so slow, and it and as it gets towards the end, it doesn't get any softer. It just yeah. builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up, but the the anguish turns into unfiltered joy by the end. Mm -hmm. That it's just this huge release of joy. And when I think about the senior class of 2020, fundamentally, I, I have nothing but, but joy thinking back on my time working with them. They're a tremendous group of, of young adults, and I hope for all of them that they do tremendous things with their lives. Uh, and I, I hope that if they're still processing uh, these emotions, that they can go to music that they enjoy. Certainly, I, I, I hope they go to classical music, but I... <laughs> I'm not their teacher anymore. I don't get to cordially require what they listen to. Uh, that that they can see that as a a healthy outlet for for feelings that are really challenging. Yep. And and we go. It, life just happens to you. Uh, I, I worked for um, a Catholic church in Des Moines as a as a cantor uh, for for many years prior to coming to Port Angeles. And. I would talk to the priest, who is now a good friend of mine, about things that were, you know, happening in life and uh, challenges that I was having. And he would say, "We will survive this and worse." Yeah. And and every time the the and worse was always sort of worrying, but there there has there's always the next challenge, whether or not it's you know worse per se. Uh, but you can't just unload the baggage of having survived some experience, thinking that you're not going to encounter challenge again. Right. That's, That's right. the whole reason that we have the, the systems of discipline that we're trying to train young people to yep. keep is so that you can weather the next storm and you know that the next monsoon season is, is, is coming. Yep. Uh, it, just because you survived the last one doesn't mean another one isn't, isn't on the horizon out there. Yep. Um, uh, I, I really enjoy where this, this conversation has gone and I, I hope students take it to heart what we're saying about the opportunity to work on their own sound and and to see see that not as uh being deprived of the experience to make music with their friends but the opportunity to improve their own sound and to love their own sound because there's going to be times where you'll feel lonely in life uh, you know certainly in college when it's just you working on your paper by yourself or uh, if you don't choose to go to college when you're, you know, just by your lonesome trying to find work or maybe you're in a line of work where there's not a lot of time for collegiality to make friends. Uh, you, it's, I, I've said this in the podcast before, but when you're on the airplane and the announcement comes on of, of affix the mask to yourself before helping others is we, we really do need to take care of ourselves before we can, you know, make meaningful connections with or help the people around us. Uh, well, and the thing I found, and, and I'm not much for computer use, I, I, <laughs> I just, I, I started teaching before computers and, and before copy machines and before video machine, I, you know, I, I taught before you know, all of those things. <laughs> and, and, and the resources that are available now, just sitting down and looking, you know, I, uh, to, to be able to go to a, a, a master violin class or a cello class or and 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 to to uh to hear the discussion and of, of how they're working to improve their sound or to improve their expressiveness or to improve their intonation or you know whatever it might be uh, those resources weren't even they weren't even a glimmer of thought when i first started teaching but your students and and anybody else who might be listening have those like this uh, to, to be able to, from, from their own bedroom, to, <laughs> to be able to access all of that. And that's pretty remarkable to me. And, you know, when you're talking about developing your, yourself, developing your qualities, developing, you know, whatever, to be able to access mentorship mm -hmm. in a wide variety of ways, uh, you, you have that ability now and the time to be able to, to do that as you're, as you're, 
lamenting at home, I guess. <laughs> well, and, and you mentioned the starting teaching before computers. Is there, there are still folks out there teaching who, who that, to whom that applies. Yep. That, yeah. that, and, you know, I'm young enough that uh, we were the first people in the city of Othello to have internet access. I think I maybe used it to download a, a freeware, you know, like the, the snake game before everybody knew what the little snake game was, where the dots follow each other around and gets spent hours doing that as a child. Um, but I, the, the teachers will need our students' grace from time to time because we are working on ourselves as teachers the same way that the students are. Hopefully sure. we're a little bit farther along with, with the, the discipline and, and such, uh, but it's important that we have grace with each other. Yeah. Uh, because like, like my experience with, uh, with Dale Johnson when I was in Tacoma Youth Symphony, um, is I really felt rotten when he said that to me of, I don't want your excuse, I, I need you to be ready. Uh, but that, it, it spun around in my head like a top and it, it wouldn't go, and it, you could say it haunted me, uh, but it, it taught me about that the, the excuse doesn't change what, what happened when you, when you make a mistake. Right. What changes is what you do after. Sure. And, and our teachers out there, hopefully, are going to say, you know what, class, it looks like this isn't working, and I need your grace, and we're going to try something different. And, and I know we're going to try plan A through triple Q until we find out what uh, connects our students with music more powerfully. And, uh, and we're going to need that grace to, to figure it out how to best uh, communicate with kids. We've already had, you know, the, the three, four months uh, last spring of, of really figuring out a lot of things that didn't work. And especially as the music teacher to try and work around some of these, you know, advanced placement and international baccalaureate classes uh, where we're not overwhelming our students. Because, you know, I'd love my students to have access to, you know, music theory and maybe start composition. And, but that would entail teaching them 17th century counterpoint on top of their, you know, reading Catcher in the Rye and doing, you know, calculus homework. Got to find a way to, to balance all of that so it's digestible. And, 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 and grace is an important part uh, of, of any, any line of work um, from both ends. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're reaching sort of the apex of the conversation here, and there's just a couple of questions that I ask of all my guests before we, we go ahead and, and sign off. Sure. Uh, my first uh, question is, if you can think of a time in your life when maybe you were struggling, and it, it could have been recently or, or, or much longer ago, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to relate to music, uh, if you could go back in time and, and give yourself advice on how to have avoided the problem or to, to get past it, what might that advice be? The, if, if you aren't trying something you can't do, you're never going to grow. And, um, And just by saying you're going to try something doesn't mean it's going to work. So, so you know that there's going to be a, a lot of failure along the way. Uh, I think it was Albert Einstein that, that uh, tried 10,000 different ways to build a light bulb. There, that's the story anyway. And uh, so there was a reporter that said, you know, what, how, how, does, that, how does that feel to have failed 10,000 times? And Einstein re replied, he said, fail. He says, I've now learned 10,000 ways not to build a light bulb. So, <laughs> so, there's, so there's, there's, there's a positive in the negative in that, mm. okay, I, I, I tried this. It didn't work right. Um, and so I, I still need to keep trying. Probably shouldn't just keep hitting my head against that brick wall. Maybe I need to find a doorway or a, a corner you know, around somehow. To, to figure this out. And I think in that striving to, um, 
to, to find the answer, that striving to get over the hump. Uh, I was an athlete in, in, in uh, school and, uh, and, you know, how, how to get, how to get to that next level, you know, there, I, I had to come up with new, new ways of, of making it work. Um, and, um, and I learned not only, not only the new thing, but I learned a lot about myself along the way of, of how I learned, how I worked, what worked best for me, what was the, what was the, the, the most best used of my time. You know, there was a lot of things that I learned in addition to finally getting, getting to the right answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, you know, you can't just try it once and quit. <laughs> One thing that uh, I, there, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Mary Jo Ridholm. She recently retired from the Olympia School District. She was a, a middle school and elementary strings teacher. And she was one of the violin coaches for, for SOGO, which I was a part of mm -hmm. as a student and then later on as a violin coach myself. Sure. And, and we, we had a nice long conversation about uh, right before I was uh, going to get married to my current wife. Um, and she offered to take me out for dinner. And uh, we had this long conversation that kind of went to places I didn't expect uh, to go. And we were talking about uh, I think originally taking auditions as a violinist because at, at the time I was uh, auditioning for the Ensign Symphony, which we had the pleasure to rehearse for, but didn't have the pleasure of uh, bringing the concert to a fruition. And and uh, at the very least, the rehearsals were quite enjoyable. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, so I'm preparing for this audition, this audition and thinking about uh, defeat in an audition, which as if you're trying to be a solo musician or a, a you know a professional musician, defeat is something you're going to encounter a lot, and it's it sometimes it's you just weren't the best one that day, and sometimes it's that you made a mistake. Uh, but her advice to me was that we tend to equate defeat with shame, and instead we need to think about defeat as challenge, as opportunity, as yep. something to be overcome that defeat is just success that hasn't happened yet. Yep. yep. And, it, and it's it, not always going to go the way you want or thought best, but there might be a better best around the corner. Yes, absolutely. That uh, the goal that we set out to may not always be the goal that we end up with or the goal that we were meant, meant to end up with. Yep. Uh, that's beautiful advice. I can't think of anything better to say after that. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say thank you so much, Mr. Rice, for coming on and, and talking to my students and the fellow educators that watch this podcast. Uh, we so appreciate the many, many years of service that you, uh, you have given to students. I, I'm sure hundreds, if not thousands out there uh, preaching the gospel of, of what you taught them. Uh, being a teacher is such a unique opportunity to change the world in that we, we get to influence so many young people. And, I think and of that, anything I'd rather do. Precisely. Yeah. And, and of all the, the choices I had in my life, I, I'm so glad that teaching is where I ended up for that reason of this, this challenge and opportunity to, to help young people become better adults. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me to come on. Oh, it, it, it's been a pleasure, and, and thank you for your, your patience and grace as I was finishing up a parent meeting. I'm glad that you had that time. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've got a couple more questions off camera, but we'll okay. go ahead and say goodbye to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.